Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole planet Earth to big time Burleson, Texas, y'all? This is the Open Door Experience. Boom! That's what I'm talking about. Hello, my friends. Blessing and peace on you guys, and welcome to the fourth part of my teaching series on redeeming your timeline. And if this has been a good series for you, and if you're like, man, this is a great revelation, I want to tell you that we have tons and tons and tons of resources on this same subject that we've worked on the entire year before, knowing that this was going to take off. This was something that people are going to grab a hold of, and God is going to do great, big things with it. And I, you know, with the same measure that you put into something, that's what you get out of it. And I would just encourage you. I know that people are going to be critical of you if you have a powerful experience with Jesus. They're going to say, well, God's never moved in my life. Who do you think you are? I think I'm as somebody who actually knows Jesus. Mm. Yeah, you might know the Bible. The devil knows the Bible. What's your history with King Jesus? Are you going to be somebody that, that he uses to work in his kingdom, but he's going to say to you, I never knew you? Yeah. See, let me tell you, let me tell you how you cure that. If you're scared of the scripture that says, that says, depart from me, I never knew you, is this. Get to know him. And then you won't be scared of that. You might get in trouble for something, but it won't be that you never knew him. <laughs> That's easy to solve that scripture. Let me tell you what's a harder one. Here's a, here's a much more scary verse to me. And Samson went out as before and knew not that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. He got so carnal, he couldn't tell when God was with him and when God wasn't anymore. That is a scary verse to me. Depart from me, I never knew you. No, no. Whatever Jesus says to me, it won't be. Troy, I never knew you. <laughs> I've got a 35-year history of knowing King Jesus, and he's so good, y'all. He's so good. In spite of me and in spite of you and in spite of the world that we live in, the goodness of God is so amazing. So I'm going to be teaching part four on this. I'm going to rehack a little bit back from the very first one to get us cranked up into the place where we're going. And in the very first of these four messages, I preached a message that was called the Holy Trinity. Now, I was talking, of course, about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but I ended up talking also about time, space, and matter. Now, one of the things that we discovered is that, yes, the Trinity is real. And not only is the Trinity real, it's real that they are uniquely different, all three, but it's also real that you can't separate them. And you have to be able to, to be willing to wrap your head around that. And like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. You, there's three different parts of you that are completely different, but there's only one of you. There's your body, there's your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, all of that. And then there's your spirit. And those are three completely different parts of you. Why? Because you're made in the image of God. Being made in the image of God is not about race. Being made in the image of God is not about gender. Being made in the image of God is something completely different. And the proof that you belong to God is that you are in his image. Jesus said, let me see that coin. He pulls out a coin and says... Hey, who's, uh, whose image is on this? It says Caesar's. I mean, he throws it back at him and says, well, then give that to Caesar because it belongs to Caesar. You can tell who you, who you belong to or you can, tell, you can tell who owns you by the image that is upon you. So the life-giving side of God is the Father. And he is the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift comes down from him. The giving side of God is the Father. The creating side of God is King Jesus. The creating side of God is King Jesus. All things are made by him and all things are, my, and all things are made for him. And there's nothing that was made that was not made by him. And then the empowering side, the supernatural empowering side of God is the Holy Spirit. And we spent some time talking about that, and we spent some time talking about those three different sets, but I never actually got into the part where you really need to be able to contemplate 
and to reckon within your own heart and within your own mind the importance of, okay, now that I'm in this stage, I need to go into the next stage. And once I'm in that stage, then I'm going to go into the next stage. And specifically, these three different stages and how important it is that we get into this third stage or this third place. We're like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the reality of all the different examples of the Word of God that shows us that, you know, the first place, it's a pretty big place, and a lot of people will fit into that. But then the second place is a whole lot smaller, and then the third place is tiny, but I'm telling you, go after that anyway. Like, what? what? I'm talking about the temple, the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place. The outer court is real big. The inner court, well, you, you got to be a Levite. you got to be a priest to enter into it. And then in order to enter into the most holy place, there's only one guy a year that gets into that. And you got to be the high priest. And so it, it's like a big group of people and then a lesser group of people. And then, then it's something exclusive. Every single one of us in here has a third stage that is exclusive to us. And this... It's one of the things, friends, that you're going to have to battle throughout your lifetime is that God's going to give you such a powerful walk. And there are going to be things, man, that make sense to you and don't make sense to anybody else. And some folks are going to criticize you and they're going to be ugly to you about it. And they're, some people are going to mock you and they're going to make fun of you. But what's real is you, you, can, you can sit back and just go, well, man, this is a lonely, difficult, hard place. Or you can see it as, no, this is exclusive. They were not invited into this. And they didn't have the courage and the faith and the grace to enter into this thing that I've entered into. That's different. I don't think that there was ever a high priest that was in the presence of the most high God in the Holy of Holies going, I'm so lonely. He was in the presence of God. And the whole world was looking at him going, you've got this. You can do this. Oh my. And I think that there is a, a big difference as we begin to mature in the things of the Lord and we begin to understand, man, this isn't loneliness. This is exclusiveness. Big difference between loneliness and exclusiveness. I don't mean to belittle anybody's loneliness because I know that loneliness hurts and I'm so sorry. But I can tell you this, in some of the places where you might be struggling with, I want it so bad to share this with so many people. That thing's for you, and it's not for everybody else. Have you ever had an encounter with God, or you had a dream, or you had a revelation, or you heard something cool, uh, you know, you read some scripture, and it blew your mind, and you go to tell all your close friends and go, oh, listen to this, listen to this, nothing but crickets. It wasn't near as cool to them as it was to, them, as, as, as it was to you. That's a big red flag, but that's something exclusive that the Lord has given you permission and he's given you an invitation. And he's given you a green light. Come into me with this thing. You know, the Bible says one, one scripture, the shortest scripture in the entire Bible is two words. Jesus wept. Okay, what is, what's happening there? It's because Lazarus died. It ain't because Lazarus died. He already knew Lazarus was going to die. It was when he tried to share with his disciples he was going to raise him from the dead, and they didn't get it. Then he went to Martha, and he tried to share with her, hey, I'm going to raise Jesus from the dead. Then he went to Mary and said, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And all she did was freak out. And the Bible says that when he saw her weeping and when he saw the others weeping, he wept. It hurt that not one person got it. Now, that's just part of the human condition. It's just part of the human experience that you're going to experience things in King Jesus that it hurts because you don't really have the words to share it with anybody else. And even when you think you got it figured out how to share it with everybody else, you can't. Well, like that, that hurts. Yep, it does. It, it does hurt. Here's what I say. Do it anyway. Have those encounters with Jesus. Go on those mission trips, hear God speak, see signs, miracles, and wonders, study the word of God, be involved with people. It's risky. So these three different phases of outer court, inner court, most holy place, is also Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's also Saul and David and Solomon. It's actually Peter and James and John, right? It's 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Man, I want to live in 100-fold Christianity. And I'm not saying that I do. I, I'm not saying that I live in 100-fold Christianity. But I'm saying I want to go after it. 
This one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind me and pressing forward towards a mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Press forward. I'm going in. I'm going in. I'm going in. I'm in. I'm in. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. You know, man, uh, I see Andy Daly is in here, and Andy Daly was just a, an amazing rodeo cowboy whenever we were in high school. And uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. I bet you I rode 30 bulls before I ever rode one. Maybe 40. And Andy put me on every kind of bull you can possibly imagine. You remember all that, man? And one of them was really big too, wasn't it, Andy? One of them was huge. One of them didn't even fit in the chute. I had to go out with my boots out on top of that bull's back because it was so huge. That's because I had a, a girlfriend I was trying to impress back then. <laughs> she nearly got me killed. But I mean, I just kept hitting the ground and 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 kept, the ground and kept broke this, broke that, broke this, hurt that. And I finally got one road. Finally went the whole eight seconds. And do you know what I did after that? I retired. <laughs> Thanks, Skippy. <laughs> I was like, I cannot live my whole life after trying to ride all these bulls and not get one covered. I've got to get one covered in my lifetime. Well, friends, you, that was a long, long, long time ago. It's been a long time since I was 17. And just exactly like that, you're going to have to keep pressing in. And it's going to hurt. And you're going to have to keep pressing in. And it's going to hurt. And you're going to have to keep pressing in. And it's going to hurt. The Word of God says that when it comes to the will of God, that there is, in Romans 12, verse 2, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect. The good is what most godly people of faith press into. And let me tell you what the good will of God is. It's going to be extremely messy, but it's in the early stages of its development. That's why at the end of all seven days of creation, God looked at that mess and that chaos and all that unfinished business, and he said, it's good. The good will of God is it's there, but it doesn't look anything like what it's going to look like. It's just that God Almighty has decided he's going to call it good. And sometimes, sometimes when you first introduce faith into your life and you begin to stand with King Jesus, you stand with Jesus in the biggest mess you can possibly imagine. You do not have a strategy. You do not have a plan. Uh, you don't really have language. You might have one scripture and then you might not even have a scripture. You're just like, I'm going to believe God. And it's a mess. But you can still call it good. But then after the good will of God, do you know what the next one is? It's the acceptable will of God. That you might be able to prove what the Bible says. Prove. You know, you know what it means to prove alcohol, right? It's 80 proof. Like, no, we've never had anything but grape juice our entire life, Pastor Troy. Good. That's good. But that whole term proof means literally to qualify it and to prove it, right? To actually say, this is what's real and this is what's authentic. Well, if you're going to prove the will of God, then it is good, it is acceptable. And acceptable means you can live with it. And there's a lot of things that, are, that we settle for that we just say, hey, I can live with that. I mean, that's... That's extraordinary. It's not what I wanted it to be, and it's not ultimately what it could have been. But I tell you what, I can sure live with that. And then finally, the third stage of the will of God is perfect. And perfect, remember, friends, does not mean flawless. Perfect means all the way. And sometimes, man, you're going to have a field that is perfect, and it's still going to have weeds in it. Like how in the world could you say that it's perfect because it has its highest potential of a harvest in spite of the weeds. But someday the Lord of the harvest will show up and he will gather and separate the weeds and burn the weeds. You're not supposed to be somebody who says, well, I can't have any weeds in my field. I can't have any mistakes. I, I must have everything figured out. Those people never walk with God because that's what they think perfection is. Perfection is all the way in. Be perfect. Like, really? God, you want me to be perfect? Yeah, I want you to be all the way in. That's what I want. I don't, 
God's not asking you to be flawless. He's not asking you to present a weedless harvest, but he does want to harvest. And some people are going to give him 30 fold. Some people are going to give him 60 fold. And some people are going to give him 100 fold. It's the sun and the moon and the stars. It's death, burial, resurrection. It's humility, conviction, repentance. It's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It's lowliness, meekness, and long suffering. It's God is love, God is spirit, God is light. The power of the devil is to accuse, to deceive, and to condemn. Three mountains in Jerusalem is Gilead, Moriah, and Zion. We could go on and on and on, all the way through the word of God. Of, I mean, just countless examples of these three stages. And yet there's so little taught about it within the body of King Jesus. And guys, I can't see the Bible without seeing this thing. That you have to be willing to go through this process. When John chapter 1 verse 3 It says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Do we agree with that, guys, that Jesus made all things? Then do you remember, whenever whenever we were talking about the creation story, that John chapter 1 starts off like Genesis chapter 1, and John chapter 1 begins to tell us how that I saw the beginning, I saw it all, and it was incredible, and here's what I saw. I saw Jesus there. And then, of course, Genesis tells us that as well. In Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in the beginning is time. And God created the heaven and space. And the earth is matter. And here we got these three stages again of time and space and matter. It's like, okay, so everything within the material universe that God Almighty, or I should say King Jesus himself, as God Almighty created, falls into these three different categories. There's time. And by the way, time has past, present, and future. There's heaven. And heaven, by the way, has height, width, and depth. And then there's matter. And matter, by the way, has protons, neutrons, and electrons. These three stages, over and over and over again, in all of the material universe, everything that Jesus created, everything that he created has these three different stages. And here's what I want to tell you. He's over all those things. He's over every single bit of it. The reason why everything has three stages within it is so that we'll know the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So all the great works of God, everything that he does, everything that is manifest to you as a human being, everything you've ever perceived, everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever seen, anything that you've ever discerned or felt or touched, it all falls into three different categories, time, space and matter and everything that you've ever imagined is within that category and if you've ever imagined or ever experienced king jesus it's because heaven invaded one of those three categories which means god has no problem with stepping into time or space or matter he's a master of dealing with time space and matter he truly is and god almighty works in those three different categories upon behalf of his children. He works in all those things. And that's why Romans 8 verse 28 says, and we know that in all things, everybody say all things. God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. I'm telling you right now, God will step into your time. He will step into your space. He will step into your matter for your sake. He will. He absolutely will do that. Psalms chapter 86, verse 8 is interesting to me. And, you know, 86 is an interesting number. I've done a huge study throughout the years on 86. But if you're in the military and if you say 86 that, it means kill it. Are y'all right? Yeah, so you know that, right? Well, Psalms 86, verse 8, and 8 represents new beginnings all the way through the word of God. There's a new beginning that the Lord has for every single one of us as we lay down our lives over and over and over and over and over again. It has to do with how we lay down our lives. In Psalms 86 verse 8, the psalmist says, Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. Well, in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And I think that one of the things, if you're going to get this redeeming your timeline message, one of the things that you have to know is this. God is not afraid to jump into your time or your space or your matter. And it means, listen, that's the only way he can interact with you. 
is if God gets involved in your time or your space or your matter. There's no other way that God can interact with you because everything that you're capable of doing or knowing is within the aquarium of time, space, or matter. Right? Okay. So I want to just kind of change gears just a little bit and say this, that when I was a little boy, I said a prayer every time I ate and it was this, it went like this. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Now, I say, in Jesus' name, amen, and I'd be done. And people say, well, you know what? That's just stupid. Boy, I wish every single kid in the United States would be saying, God is great. God is good. Those are good foundations for you to teach your kids. It's not silly. Well, it's vain repetition. Shut up, you devil. There's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong in the world. The same as that people say, you can't pray in any vain repetition whatsoever. Get up and say, our father who art in heaven. And you know how that prayer starts off? When you pray, do not pray in vain repetition. But rather pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Because, because we're crazy people, that's why. There is nothing wrong with you teaching your kids fundamental principles. And there is over and over and over again. And friends, you don't need any religious devil's approval to teach your kids what's real and what's not. Amen. So I grew up saying God is great, God is good. And what I found out is that the goodness of God is in tandem with his greatness because the goodness of God is, is a tremendous way that the Lord speaks to me. And, and it's something, it's a huge part of the mission that I have is to bring the goodness of God into all kinds of situations. And I... When I think of the goodness of God, I think about the manifest presence of the Lord. Like, what are you talking about? Well, anything that we look at that has to do with time, space, or matter, anything that has happened or we think is going to happen within this thing of, of the goodness and the greatness of God. Now, the goodness of God is when God Almighty makes himself manifest. How do I know that? Because whenever, whenever Brother Moses said, Hey, um, I want to see your glory. He said, okay, I shall cause my goodness to pass before you. But before I get off into the manifest presence of the Lord and being able to see that, you need to know that you are responsible for the lens of how you view everything. This is why you need to teach your children a worldview. Um, I had a, a, a talk with a eight-year-old young man yesterday. And he had to talk with me and to tell me how that he had learned in school, how that America was bad and how America, he learned it in school, was taught, you know, America is the reason the world is so messed up. Yada, he's eight. And it didn't shock me. Um, it sickened me. But it didn't shock me. And I didn't lose hope for this young man because I know his parents and I know that they will I know that they're teaching him a foundation. But think of all the kids that all they know is Minecraft. That's it. They don't know nothing else. And all they know is Minecraft, 24 hours a day on their mama and daddy's phone. Think of those kids that do not have a sure foundation within their life. And they're going to have evil presented to them as good. And they're going to have good presented to them as evil. And I, I was thinking about this and I was thinking the responsibility that we have for our worldview is so huge, friends. It's just so big that we have to own the responsibility of our worldview. Well, I can't help but view anything other than everything's messed up because the two people I've ever loved in my life, they both left me. No, you still own the responsibility of if you see God is good or not. It's not up to those people who hurt you if you see God is good or not. It's up to you if you see that God is good or not. Look, justice is coming to them. The Lord, the Lord Jesus says, woe to those people who do such offenses. But do you know what he says right after, um, just right before that? He said, it's impossible, but that offense has come. He's like, you need to own the responsibility of dealing with the hurts of life and, and then I will own the responsibility of bringing justice to those people who do those things to you. So 
That's a good word. But friends, we have to own the responsibility of the lens. You know, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, he says, the light of the body is the eye. And if therefore your eye is single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye is evil, then the whole body shall be full of darkness. Having a single eye, what does that mean? It means a non-fragmented view. And you have to own the responsibility of that. And friends, I have to own the responsibility of that. My worldview, and if you're like, I don't really, if you don't know the term worldview, you need to do a Google search on worldview and then look up a Christian worldview and make sure that that's the lens that you see things through. It's based upon the word of God. Okay, well, just exactly like that, what's real is if your lens is wrong, everything in your life will be dark. And that's what Jesus says. So one of the lenses you have to know, one of the fundamental things that you have to understand about the perspective that God Almighty has given you is this. I can never, ever, ever let go of the fact that God is good, God is great. The greatness of God and the goodness of God belong to you. And friends, you're going to know about bad things. Can God trust you with that? Or does he have to keep you in the cellar? Can the Lord trust you with a big old giant monster world? Or are you someone that you're a baby and you have to stay in the crib? See, if you're going to grow up and if you're going to be a mighty warrior with King Jesus, you're going to have to come across stuff that you don't get and you don't understand. And you're going to have to decide, I refuse to be impressed with that level of evil. I want to be because that's scary. But no, I'm going to be impressed with the goodness and the greatness of God. And the Lord's like, what's that kid hanging on that lens? That's cool. Watch that. Watch that. That is awesome. And he's paying attention to that. And so we have to own the responsibility of that. When it comes to the goodness of God, I am always highlighting the goodness of God because the goodness of God is something that the, the Lord stirs up in my spirit and God uses it to keep me passionate. He uses it to keep me steadfast. I, I, I hear from people all the time, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. I, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> if I knew some other way to do things, I would probably do it another way. But I don't know how to not be in fifth gear all the time. Well, it's going to kill you. No, sitting on your butt is what will kill you. And not doing anything. I tell you, how many people are concerned with my health, with my health because they won't leave their house? And they won't make a difference. And they have no fruit to show of their own ministry, so all they do is criticize other people's ministries. No, I'm, thank you for your concern. Psalms chapter 27, verse 13 says, I would have fainted. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the giving, in the, in the, in the land of the living. I want to tell you, you will keep giving your life and giving your life and giving your life and giving your life if you believe I'm going to see the goodness of God today. You watch. I'm so convinced that I'm going to see the goodness of God that I literally pray this insane prayer every single day of my life. Thank you, God, for all the good things that you have coming to me that I don't have a clue about. I'm going to see something today I've never seen before. And I'm going to be so impressed. I already have a response in my spirit to go, woo that's what I was looking for. And I didn't even know what it was I was looking for. I didn't even know, but I'm like, okay, wow, that is awesome. Thank you. Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, what will make you an overcomer is if you refuse to be overcome by evil, but you overcome evil with good. And you're like, okay, I'm, I'm all about the goodness of God. So you guys know we're all about the goodness of God. But let me finish up here by talking to you about the greatness of God. Because if you just believe in the goodness of God, but you believe God is impotent, okay, that's, that's a problem. Well, he's good, but he's, there's really not much God can do. I mean, if it's in my history, there's nothing God can do about it. That's insulting. It's insulting to the Lord. Oh, okay, well, yes, God is good, but, I'm, I'm, but I am of a certain race within a certain society, and there's nothing that God can do about it. Oh, yes, he can. He can raise you up. You don't think that Jesus understands about racial stuff? He was a Jew in the midst of Roman-occupied Israel. 
You, you don't think he understands? Oh, no, he understands. Okay, well, uh, uh, okay, okay, look, I know God is good, but I, I'm poor. I've always been poor, and there's nothing the Lord can do. You know, I'm just going to be poor, and there's nothing anybody. Dude, listen, it's, it's great to believe that God is good, but you can't just believe God is good if you're not going to believe he's great. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. I learned that when I was three. And it's amazing how what you can learn at three, you cannot teach a third year theology student. <laughs> the simplicity of the greatness and the goodness of God. He's good. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 18, verse 27 says, these things are impossible with men, but they are possible with God. If you're gonna, if you're gonna believe that God can interact with your, or if, you, or if, if you're gonna believe that you will see the goodness of God in your time and in your space and in your matter, you gotta believe that what is impossible for you is not impossible for him. That it's actually possible. Now, here's the deal. A lot of people who believe that with God, all things are possible, do not believe that God is good enough to do it. And a lot of people who believe that God is good enough to do it, do not believe that God is powerful enough to do it. Yes, he is. And you are responsible for that lens. And if you do not see it that way, the parts of your life that are supposed to be full of life will indeed be dark. Psalms chapter 86, verse 8. Among gods, there is no other like you, nor are there any works that are like your works. First from verse 8. The greatness of God makes him greater than all the other gods. There's none like you. Like, well, there's no other God. Listen, you need to take that very, very, very seriously. I was reading what John Piper had to say about it this week. And he had some brilliant stuff about this. One of the things that he pointed out was that 1 Corinthians 8 verse 5 says that there are many gods and many lords. And Paul's means that there are demons, there are evil spirits. 1 Corinthians 10 20, Satan himself is called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4 4. And the God of this age in John 12 verse 31. Therefore... You can believe that David meant what he was talking about whenever he wrote this, and he said, there's no other God that's like you, and nor are there any other works that are like your works. First John chapter 5, verse 19 says, the whole world lies in the power of the devil, right? That's First John 5, verse 19. But know this, John, First John 4, 4 says, he who is greater in you is greater who is in the world. Well, I want to tell you, there's tons and tons and tons of revelation that go with this scripture, but one of them is this. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world, right? Okay, do you know who else is in the world? I am. The one that is in me is greater than me. So if I mess something up, he can handle it. So I don't got to be worried about everywhere I go. I can't never make a mistake. Everything has to go perfect. I got to make sure everybody's happy with what I do and what I say. And I got to make sure that I got everything figured out. No, I don't. I have to carry the presence of Jesus with me into all those places. Because greater is he who is within me than me. Oh, I believe in the goodness of God and I believe in the power of God. I sure do. All right. In conclusion, guys. I want to just say this, that when God created all things and he joined his creation to time and to space and to matter, he programmed his DNA with components of hope that cannot be altered. And friends, I want to, in every single situation, there's a component of hope that God Almighty has already placed in that, in all things that are created. But the deal is this, if you don't seek the kingdom first, you will never see those things. You will only be a reactionary leader. Friends, I want to tell you, one of the reasons why churches cannot grow and churches cannot, guys, I go through this whole church and I tell my whole staff, if you're not, if you're just standing there shooting the bull, you're just a reactionary leader. Go find somebody and bring the kingdom to them. Go, go, go. Do not be standing around waiting for something to show up for you to solve. Go challenge something and solve it and make it better and take it from here to there. and Go, 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 go. Do not be a reactionary leader. Most churches will never grow because all they have is reactionary leaders. And do you know why people are reactionary leaders? Because they're lazy. They don't want to engage. They're scared they're going to mess up. They're scared they're going to get in over their head. Don't be like that. God Almighty has given you the command 
to go. And in everything you get involved in, there's a component of hope that is in there that you never would have seen had you not been engaged in it. Oh, the sweet redemption of King Jesus is meant to be discovered and experienced without measure. I'm reading the conclusion of my book, and this is what it says. Our key to the power of this beautiful marriage between the Lord and his bride is simply never being able to imagine any single part of our lives without first thinking about our life with him. That's the key to any beautiful marriage. So in wrapping this up, let me remind you that you will still have time. Your pastime is still your pastime, and Jesus wants you to discover him and experience him there. Your present time is your time with him to live and to breathe his life more abundantly. And your future time is ready to be the room where Jesus is. Unveiling his glory and new prophetic upgrades and green lights of joyous discovery and adventure, Jesus is thrilled at the opportunity to live life with you in the dangerous places of time and space and matter. His heart longs to find us thrilled at the same opportunity to live with him in those same places. When we find him there, we find that he is not afraid. He is victorious and he is full of hope. He is full of appreciation and love of life. He is willing and ready to confront evil and bless every place with transformation in his kingdom dominion. He wants to find us in those same exact places exactly like he is. He wants to make us be as he is because we see him instead of seeing our slave master in the past, the present, or the future. The promise of the Word of God is that when we do see Him, we will be like Him. And now that is redeeming time. 1 John 3, 2. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Hope for every season, a cross for every time, redemption and exchange of life for death for every hour of the day. So now it is time to accept the invitation, the permission, and the commandment to change your measures of time to places where King Jesus rules from his throne. He wants to bring his kingdom and save you in every way that a person can be saved. Our Redeemer lives and he is not subject to time. Time is made subject to him. Redeeming time says the salvation of your past, present, and future is not behind you, it's not in front of you, it's right now. The great I am is ready to bring your redemption and your salvation to all things past, present and future. He's ready right now. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. And behold, now is the day of salvation. Peace to you in Jesus' name. Guys, let's give the Lord a great big praise. First, I want to ask y'all to stand up.